So then, um, welcome everybody uh, for tonight's um, lecture of uh, the Society for Intercultural Philosophy uh, organized in um, collaboration with uh, the College of Fellows of Tübingen University. Uh, I'm glad so many of you uh, join us tonight uh, for the lecture of um, Gabriele Osthoff Munich, whom I very briefly introduced to you uh, in a second. Uh, let me uh, take the chance and um, uh, send you the, uh, the homepage uh, um, uh, uh, via the chat um, of our society. Uh, please visit our, um, our homepage. You can find uh, all earlier uh, SIP lectures recorded um, uh, there, and you'll find much more uh, interesting information about events the society is planning or has pursued in the past about publications uh, and about uh, actual topics of intercultural philosophy. And you're also very much invited to become a member of the society if you're interested. Um, a very warm welcome to Gabriele Munich. Uh, she um, uh, she um, is president of the Association Internationale de Professeurs de Philosophie, and uh, she is also a member of the uh, board of our Society of Intercultural Philosophy. Um, she has well, she started off uh, um, studying uh, philosophy and, and mathematics and uh, did her PhD uh, in Berlin at Humboldt University with Oswald Schwemmer and uh, Volker Gerhardt. And after um, uh, teaching at the University of Münster and the University of Innsbruck, she's now author of philosophical books. Uh, and uh, she has visited her, uh, her uh, homepage. She has an own, an own uh, homepage and you'll find plenty of books very interesting on all different kinds of topics. Let me just mention two uh, which are most relevant uh, for uh, tonight's um, talk. The one um, is called Translate Language, Diversity and Intercultural Humanoidics. Uh, and the other uh, is, uh, has a German title, Das Bild vom Bild, uh, Bild Semiotik und Bildphänomenologie in Interkultureller uh, Perspektive. Uh, welcome to you, and the title of tonight's talk is, is Intercultural Communication Possible on the Difficulty of Adequate Translations. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm pleased uh, that you are, the, the listeners are um, interested in the topic of intercultural communication tonight. But, uh, let me first start with a general remark on current occasion that, of course, intercultural communication is perverted quite in the sense of Kant if we do not tell the truth or try to manipulate with fake news. We do not really communicate something. What I have in mind tonight is a more fundamental and often unconscious difficulty, that of different languages and language worlds which we do not realize if we rely on interpreters. I'll show you my points, just a minute, to give you the structure of the talk. There it is. I have six points tonight, but let me first begin with uh, the main work, Le Différent by Jean-François Lyotard. He maintains that in intercultural discourse and international discourse, many potential speakers are excluded because they do not speak the language of discourse well enough. It may seem that uh, the culture of exchanging rational arguments belongs to a Western tradition, which is, for instance, rejected by some parts of the Islamic world. 
But of course, we have traditions of communications elsewhere, for instance, in the African tradition of Palava or in the Fiji tradition of Talanoa dialogue, which was even practiced by members of the World Climate Council. But there is still another problem if different languages are concerned. For instance, if your mother tongue is one of the more than 500 Bantu languages, you will hardly be able to be heard in international discourse if you do not speak a lingua franca well enough. Liotard's ethos, however, is to do justice to the individual, which will never be possible if these individuals are sentenced to silence. They may not be able to articulate themselves in the necessary language. So the focus here is on language as a precondition to be understood in intercultural dialogue. And this is where intercultural language philosophy comes in. And now to my six points. First, different structures in foreign languages, which provide a different access to the world. Second, your synthetic perspectives and the problem of natural logic in Wolf. Third, universal grammar in Chomsky and translation. Fourth, are relativistic theories more trans, uh, suitable? And fifth, my solution, Wittgenstein's family resemblances, speech, speech acts and forms of life. And the last one, communication between different cultures. Can we rely on interpreters? So now, now I go back. first point, foreign languages, the different structures which provide a different access to the world. I begin with Anton Wilhelm Amo, who in 1707 came to Germany from West Africa. In his early years, he was sold as a slave and bought in order to serve as a chamberlain at a German court. But he was fortunate enough to be fostered like by a duke. He was socialized in German and Latin, not only philosophically, was highly acknowledged academically, became the first philosopher of African origin in Germany, who even taught at German universities, and he had the intelligence to publish even in Latin. In addition, he learned three other Indo-European languages and Hebrew. He absorbed whole worlds of languages, not only with the help of philosophical publications, and used them to formulate his own thoughts, for instance, in his dissertation about the rights of the so-called Moors in Europe. He would not have been able to formulate these thoughts by which we can now assign him to early enlightenment in his native language. For the more than 2000 indigenous African languages, all of which form the basis for very diverse cultural identities are so marginalized in academic discourse still today that they are, quote from Marber, hardly considered in inter-intellectual discourses. Beyond that, however, it is not just about ongoing political marginalization, even in times of post-colonialism, in which one still has to identify forms of language imperialism. It is also about very basic structural linguistic differences that can make adequate translations difficult. Marbert, himself African philosopher teaching in Berlin makes it clear that quote, the translation of abstract terms into African languages represents a major challenge for African philosophers, unquote. Marbert makes a suggestion to himself how this could happen for instance, in his native language, Basaic, which is one of the more than 500 Bantu languages. He circumscribes notions that do not yet exist in his language. For instance, idea, something not real that one only sees when thinking, or civilization, understanding or enjoying life. The examples show that whole fields of meaning are not transported in this simplified transfer. And this can only be a first step on the way into enabling African thinkers to articulate themselves philosophically and scientifically in their own languages, not only to be heard in international discourse, but also to make themselves understood 
in their own language to the speakers of the same linguistic community in order to encourage common reflection here too. Furthermore, it is not just about terms as in Marbe, although already here, intercultural interesting differences emerge beyond just importing terms. The Sino-Japanese term ki or chi, for instance, allows phenomena to be combined in one term that we tend not to combine, which, quote, Elberfeld in his book on language means that, that some things can be expressed more simply and at the same time in a more differentiated way. And the notion of culture in our language area occurs differently in other languages, for instance, as wind, feng in Japanese, according to Ohashi, who wrote an essay on this notion of culture. Rather, it, it is about basic differences in language structures, as I would like to illustrate with two other African languages, because the above mentioned difficulty with abstract terms is not simply curious or even a sign of lower abstraction ability, and thus as often assumed previously a sign of inferior intelligence, mm -hmm. but it is already laid out in the grammar of some languages. For example, in La Philosophie Bantu Rwandaise de Lettres, African author Kagame draws the attention to the fact that here in these languages, a being cannot be expressed in purely grammatical terms in isolation from its place and other determinations, which prevents abstract use. And in Ever, one of the nine languages officially promoted in Amos homeland Ghana, we even do not find a verb to be. Here, quote, the concept of being, or what we would call by this name, is divided into several verbs, a quote by Benveniste, 1977. But Benveniste, whose linguistic investigations are by no means outdated, comments, this description of facts in the ever language contains something partly artificial. It was undertaken from the perspective of our language and not as it should be within the framework of the examined language itself. Nothing within ever language and morphology or ever syntax connects these five verbs. Only in relation to our own linguistic habits do we discover something which is common to all of them. The advantage of this one could say egocentric comparison from our perspective lies precisely in this. It gives us information about ourselves in this variety of uses of to be. In Greek, it shows us a situation specific to the Indo-European languages and by no means a universal situation or a necessary fact. We cannot say what place being has in ever metaphysics, but a priori, the term has to be articulated quite differently there. This was a quote by Ben Venist, the same book. In our culture, however, the copula is, as a link between subject and object, has at least three meanings, identity, inclusion, and existence. But how is this in languages that have no copula at all, such as Hebrew, Russian, or Arabic? And how is it in languages that do not even know the Indo-European subject verb object construction? For example, in languages like Nordka, spoken by indigenous people of Vancouver Island, a language without any subjects, which consists only of verbs in order to express the processes of being more adequately. How is it in subjectless languages, such as Japanese? In contrast to this, Weisgerber, in his famous essay on man in the accusative, concluded that Indo-European languages have a different access to the world. I see you is quite different from you in my eyes. The other is the subject in this case, as Polynesian would, uh, Polynesians would put it, behind which we can suspect a hidden metaphysics. Against this background, it is interesting to examine the other linguistic forms in which metaphysical thinking is articulated in the other language families, 
without starting from the Eurocentristic projection that we will find our own in other cultures, the same or similar. For if we always me measure the foreign against the standard of our own, the, the specifics of foreign ways of thinking will necessarily remain hidden from us. Already Leibniz was keen to get to know other perspectives as a corrective and complement to his own perspectives. Different languages always mean different access to the world and the different ways of thinking, for instance, about nature can enrich our thinking. Translation programs that offer us the foreign ready-made and already transposed into our own are not helpful for better understanding. My second point is on Eurocentristic projections and natural logic in Wolf. The mentioned projection is not at all rare. In a famous thought experiment invented by Quine, a linguistic field researcher has to investigate a jungle language which is completely unknown to him and has never been translated before. At first, he has to work out a kind of dictionary. Seeing a rabbit hobbling by and hearing at the same time a native comment, Gavagai, he concludes that this must be the name for rabbit. But according to Quine himself, it could as well mean a fly that constantly appears together with rabbits, or it could refer to a certain part of the body, such as long ears. And it could also name a certain function, for instance, lunch or runs fast which perhaps someone with a Chinese language background might more likely be interested in. Indo-European languages with roots in Sanskrit have a strong tendency to nominal expressions, whereas Chinese thought is predominantly process oriented and for example, does not know the notion of substance at all. It was already Humboldt as early as in 1836 who classified Sanskrit and Chinese as being completely different. Quine now holds that the situation of the first, he calls it radical translation, is not clear at all. This is his principle of indeterminacy and needs further inquiries. Then it turns out that the field linguist is by no means a blank slate but is rather subject to certain requirements of his mother tongue, which remain unanalyzed. He has to ask again, and in questioning the natives, he has to learn the synonym of yes and no. But Quine rightly notes here that you can misinterpret these utterances as a member of a certain culture, as for instance, in Turkey, a vertical movement of the head indi indicates a disagreement which can also be interpreted as agreement by a member of a different culture, thus suggesting the exact opposite truth value of the observation sentence. The linguist is supposed to come very far with some analytical hypotheses. Quine, once he has conjectures that concern the identity, the copula and the associated particles, he can translate terms using the stimulus synonymy of uh, sentences. According to Quine, the logical connections and or and if then can also be determined from language behavior as an implicit byproduct. A quote from his word and object book. He starts from the premise that an appropriate translation should leave the laws of logic untouched which assumption is no longer empirical nor behavioristic. If there is a logical contradiction based on classical two-valued logic, of course, in a translation, the translation is most probably incorrect, he follows, because the speaker is benevolently assumed to have the same sort of rationality. This is his arrogant, in my view, principle of benevolence. But against the background of the three-valued logic of the Aymara, for instance, a South American indigenous tribe and the seven-level predication theory of the Jaina in India, one could now clearly recognize Quine's Eurocentristic perspective. 
With Quine, we are forced to project the ontology of a background language or background theory onto the native language. And this can and will lead to distortions. Locke criticizes in his book on Quine and Davidson, we need not project most of our beliefs onto the natives. This makes room not just for counting them wrong. It may transpire that on some issues, the natives don't not only hold different views, but that they are right and we are wrong. In approaching a foreign text or culture, we must keep in mind the possibility that we might have something to learn. Wolf here speaks of natural logic in this often unconscious background theory, which we use to interpret foreign language patterns. Quote, Natural logic tells us that speaking is just, just an incidental process that only involves passing on thoughts and has nothing to do with the formulation of thoughts. In speaking or in using language, we often believe that we only express what has been formulated in a non-linguistic way before. According to this view, thinking does not depend on grammar, but on the laws of logic or reason, which are the same for all observers of the universe and which represent something rational in the universe that can be found by intelligent observers, whether they may speak Chinese or Choctaw, end of quote. But this natural logic does not realize that, quote again, the language phenomena are largely of a background character to the speaker and therefore remain outside his critical conscience. Thus, if someone speaks according to his natural logic about reason logic and the laws of correct thinking, she will easily follow purely grammatical givens that have a background character in his or her own language, but which by no means are valid in all languages, nor represented, represent a general substrate of reason. On the basis of his investigations into the Hopi language, Worf had found out that there are other notions and structures of time different from European languages because there are only two correlating tenses in Hopi grammar, manifested and manifesting. Because of a cyclic idea of time, you cannot say tomorrow is a new day as it is the same day occurring again. On the basis of these and similar observations, Wolf had formulated his principle of linguistic relativity, which maintains that our thought structures depend on the grammatical categories of our mother tongues. It was exactly this which, according to Benvenist, had happened to the categories in Aristotle, to whom we owe our so-called classical logic. Quote Benvenist, it seems to us that these distinctions are primarily categories of language, that in fact Aristotle, thinking in absolute terms, simply finds certain basic categories of the Greek language in which he himself thinks." End of quote. The thesis was formulated already two years earlier by Kagame, and as early in 18, as in 1840, in Trendelenburg's logical investigations, and later taken over by Brunswick. And it was even discussed 900 years earlier in Baghdad in 932 in a famous debate on the universality of logic and the relativity of grammar between the logician Abu Bishamata and the grammarian Abu Said al-Sirafi, in which the latter opposed the claims of Greek logic and philosophy. Dianya, Senegalese philosopher teaching at Columbia, New York, uh, quote, quote, il y a une logique grecque comme il y a une logique arabe, laquelle n'est autre que la grammaire de l'arabe. Bodmer speaks of the false belief that the linguistic habits of the European peoples are in accordance with universal principles of logic. But, quote, this complete system of logic that grew out of the disputes of the medieval scholastics was based on a wrong grammatical conception on the simplest form of a proposition. The scholastics, namely, believed that the simplest form of an assertion must contain the verb to be, and that be, in this context, expresses a real existence. And this is already laid out in the Greek word 
on and its possible uses. Third point, a question, is there a grammar of universal validity? This is where today's best known antithesis to the principle of linguistic relativity comes in. Chomsky's conception of a universal grammar that must underlie all languages, this universal grammar being a sort of logical framework for every language. For him, the same language independent structured reason with universal rules behind, works behind all languages. Then of course, any translation that goes back to language independent thinking above or below the languages is unproblematic. In Chomsky, we find a continuation of Leibniz's idea of a logical universal language, which of course goes back to Descartes' Mathesis Universalis, the idea of an innate, innate kind of genetic disposition, which Chomsky imagines as a general language competence. It is given to us a priori, analogous to Descartes' innate ideas and has influenced the communicative a priori in Habermas. Chomsky invokes Cartesian linguistics, which he already identifies in France in the 17th century, for the first time among the grammarians of the school of Port Royal, who in 1660, just 10 years after Descartes' death, have developed a grammaire générale et raisonné, which undoubtedly influenced Leibniz. In contrast to the particular grammars of the various languages and language conventions, we are talking here about a general grammar that defines the nature of thinking and is therefore universal. A question for my fourth point, are relativistic theories more suitable? So universalists argue with relativists in intercultural language philosophy about the relationship between thinking and language and the mutual influences that arise from them. For universalists, general and universally valid thought structures are available a priori at the bottom of all languages, which enable understanding since they always make appropriate translations possible. And here a line can be drawn from Chomsky back to Leibniz, Descartes, Aus Magna of Raimundus Lullus, and we can even trace this line back to Platonic conceptions of ideal existence as origin of all multiplicity. For relativists, on the other hand, language independent thinking is not at all possible. It always arises with and in the language structures of our mother tongues. And even if we later learn other languages, the first imprints <clears throat> are retained. Advocates of the diversity and peculiarity of languages refer to Nietzsche on the one hand and to Worf's thesis of linguistic relativity on the other hand. Here a line can be drawn from his teacher Edward Sapphire, who emigrated from Germany to America to Herder's and Humboldt's language philosophy. And finally, the postmodern appreciation of plurality and diversity influenced among others by Nietzsche and American pragmatism can be traced back to pre-Socratics so estimated by Nietzsche, for instance, in Potarvas. Other languages we implicitly get to know other ways of thinking. And for the philosophy of translation, it follows that adequate translations between languages usually only exist within language families with similar structures. For instance, within the Indo-European language family, which Worf calls standard average European languages. But even within these languages, fam language families, we find expressions that cannot be translated, as Echo has shown. For instance, it must be noted that Heidegger's ontical ontological difference with the distinction, distinction between Sein and Zionist can hardly be understood in English. There is only one expression, namely being there. And the notion of citizenship, citoyenneté, is not translatable appropriately into German. The art of translation then consists in finding equivalent expressions of the same meaning in different languages, according to Ricoeur, 2016. 
and where textual fidelity is not possible in finding creative substitute solutions so that speakers of the target language can understand adequately what has been meant. Doing so, however, however, the original meaning can be distorted, as can be shown in using the examples of Bible and Quran translations. Thus, translators are always on a tightrope walk, not only between the respective languages, but also between textual fidelity and addressee orientation in the target language. Thanks to their language skills, translators are a paradigm for intercultural translate, understanding. They are mediators and have a bridging function. Linguistic research today seems to agree with the last line of tradition described, but in view of the difficulties with and fears of relativism, which always brings uncertainty, the need for at least some linguistic universals in our minds as a kind of universal software seems immense. We would love to believe that we can always translate and understand everything without giving up what is familiar to us. Is there a way out of the dilemma, a position that maybe both sides can live with? I find such a position in Wittgenstein and his theory of family resemblances. Do languages have a common substantial essence, for instance, a common logical or grammatical structure prevailing behind them, to which one only has to go back in order to be able to translate expressions with the same meaning, or are they just conventions that cause us to see the word differently? According to Takayama, Japanese philosopher teaching in Tokyo, one can certainly assume that one is closer to nature in subjectless languages. What is the justification for using the same general names? The question refers to the medieval dispute on universal, in which the positions of idealism, Plato, realism, Aristotle, and nominalism, Occam, have developed. Universal names are either anteres Plato in, in rebus, as in Aristotle, or just arbitrary names that have solidified posteres, as in Occam. So that any common essence as reason for general designations is illusion. The dispute continues up to this day and is interpreted in the English speaking community as a conflict between essentialism and conventionalism. In my view, Wittgenstein has found a solution between the two positions, which is not based on the category of substance, the question is posed incorrectly, but on that of relation. Languages do not have a common essence, for instance, a universal grammar that connects them with all, all with one another, why we call them languages, but rather we can observe family resemblances, a notion that Wittgenstein takes over from Jung. They form a coherent network in which areas of common or similar phenomena may overlap, whereas they can seem very strange in other aspects. In addition to that, after Wittgenstein's turn to normal language theory, you have to see languages not only morphologically and independent of their respective life world and the concrete speech context. Wittgenstein's identity thesis, where he identifies meaning and use, semantics and pragmatics, does not only refer to whole sentences in a certain context, but more generally to speech acts. The yes before a judge or a registrar, for instance, will have a different meaning as is the case with the term group in a discussion among mathematicians or sociologists. So the context is always essential in order to fix the meaning. And to mention a more complex example, the same term picture can be used in the sense of picture carrier, the medium, picture reference, what is depicted or presentation, and thus designate different aspects. The sentence is, the picture has a crack, the picture shows my father, or the subject of the picture is particularly well executed, mean different aspects of the notion. And the context shows us which aspect is meant. Moreover, the notion of picture 
has different meanings intertwined with various cultural religious conceptual traditions, such as that of dangerous suggestive real presence of the depicted, which has to be excluded under all circumstances up to radical image prohibitions in some religions. And on the other side, pictures as indicative signs or traces that can only hint at what is depicted, an interpretation that may lead to accept even pictures of God. Not only the idea of a conceptual history comes into play here, which will be explained later again, but also a context sensitivity that is linked to the respective forms of life and language games, which generate meaning. Thus, Wittgenstein's relativism is of a different kind than Worf's and has been called language game relativism. Unlike Worf, it is not the grammar of our mother tongues that leads and even determines us to think this way and not otherwise. We can and must follow certain rules in order to be understood by others. But we can transcend these rules in a creative way. In his study of Asian philosophy, Heidegger clearly saw that our Indo-European languages with all often tend to nominal constructions require a sort of thinking against language itself and a deconstruction of our own terminologies in order to gain more space for processual aspects. Wittgenstein, languages are like railway tracks which have brought us here from the past and to which we have been bound but we can and must continue to build them into the future by ourselves. And for this purpose, we can use structures and notions that we find in other languages because transitions into understanding other language worlds are possible by using the overlaps in commonality. They are not totally strange. And this is important for translation as for intercultural dialogue as well. To raise the question again, does thinking determine the languages or do the respective language uh, <clears throat> does the respective language determine our way of thinking? Wittgenstein's conception makes a dialectical position possible in which our thinking is shaped naturally by the conventions of traditional language structures, but nevertheless is able to generate other forms of language in the face of other possibilities which in turn can re-influence our thinking in a new way in order to direct it into the future. However, as Wittgenstein's private language argument has shown, there is no language independent thinking prior to language against Chomsky. If we want to denote internal states, such as states of pain, not only for others, but for ourselves, and even if we want to perceive them in their specific nature, we need the conceptual differences and differenti differentiations given in our languages, so that from this point of view, even the distinction between inside and outside becomes obsolete or nonsensical. Different languages offer and present different perspectives on the world, which can generate different views, but which we can empathize with, as Amor was able to do. But these different perspectives do not end up in total relativism, which would make any understanding and any intercultural dialogue impossible. In my conception of multi-perspectivity with three stages, I have shown that different views can enrich us and widen and complement our thinking. It was in this sense that Walter Benjamin expressed a hope for the future if we experience otherness and strangeness when translating foreign languages. Quote, since it is never possible to reproduce all the meanings of the source language in the target language, we have to leave ourselves to the feeling that all languages may in the end converge in so far as in each of them as a whole, the same may be meant which however cannot be attained at by one of them, but only by the totality of their complementary intentions." End of quote. Yet we are still far away from such a synopsis. We still know far too little about the culturally rooted languages of the world, although comparative linguistic research has made great progress. And here, once again, Robertson's phrase of glocalization proves to be appropriate. 
dealing with the processes of globalization with the help of a lingua franca, such as at the moment English and increasingly Spanish, seems to be necessary to solve, solve global problems adequately. But these languages alone are completely insufficient for a better understanding of the other world perspectives from which we could learn other views if these particular features are not leveled out too quickly. So processes of relocalization into particular linguistic worlds are always necessary in order to describe and really understand foreign cultures and the corresponding language worlds, not only from the outside, by projecting our own schemes of interpretation onto the foreign. Only by a real change of perspective can we learn and better grasp the specificity of our own approach, and we thereby experience that our own culturally rooted language background and the associated worldviews have blind spots. We do not see that we do not see. And only through this experience of changing perspectives, more global perspectives could be possible in a meaningful way, on a higher level, without leveling out diversity. My last point, communication between cultures. In the early summer of 2016, the German federal government presented a white paper in which they spoke of a challenge regarding the Russian attitude towards Ukraine. The Russian press translated this with the word for threat and reported indignantly about Germany's new opposition. In view of recent history, this led to panic reactions among Russian politi politicians but also prompted them to verbal aggression, which resulted in a considerable deterioration of climate and diplomatic difficulties. Intentional or unintentional translation errors can distort meaning and make intercultural communi communication and understanding more difficult. But the difficulties go far beyond translation errors or manipulation. For example, the former US Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, once reported on a conversation with the late Kim Jong-il, in which she came to think that they had agreed on a moratorium on missile tests. Whereas it later emerged <clears throat> that North Korea was already pursuing a pro program for the production of highly enriched uranium. She concluded, so we know they are lying. It is noteworthy that a high-ranking diplomat, unaware of nuances, seems to have relied on mere translation of the spoken word. However, one has to know that in Korean, as in Japanese, the spoken word is put into perspective by the length of the pauses, which, especially at conferences, allows the various parties to save face and is an expression of politeness. In addition to the spoken word, there is a nonverbal subtext that members of an expressive culture often do not even notice because they are fixated on the spoken word. But what when can we understand by the notion of expressive culture? In their book on intercultural communication, Dagmar Kumbia and Friedemann Schulz von Thun apparently have chosen authors in order to transfer the model of the inner team and the communication square with four sides of self-disclosure, content, reference, and appeal into the dimension of intercultural understanding. I will stick with the example of Japanese. In the corresponding article, Why Karl and Kaizo Nerve Each Other, the authors distinguish between two different actions concepts of communication between Germans and Japanese. On the one hand, we find a context-sensitive situative orientation on the side of the Japanese interlocutor, and on the German side, we find an expressive orientation that does not take into account the situative surroundings. The corresponding cultural squares on the self-concept diagnose a community self on the Japanese side and an individual self on the German side. The distinction is even further driven into an orientation at relations and an orientation at facts and into a distinction between implicit and explicit communication in order to arouse sensitivity 
to mutual accusations in the case of unsuccessful communication. An example, the Japanese utterance, you practice a lot of piano, can by no means be understood by the other side as a polite and implicitly packaged criticism of excessive noise pollution, but rather as an appreciative utterance in the sense of keep it up. So misunderstandings are normal. In a culture of courtesy that is oriented towards relations and implicit communication, the bare truth can often be subordinate, even thought to be rude, which is totally different from expressive and explicit communication styles. Here we do refrain, as I said in the beginning, from perversions of intercultural and intracultural communication by false assertions. We focus on the unintentional and unconscious. The whole book deals with problems of understanding because of different underlying cultural traditions and imprints, and never, which is rather strange, is the focus on various specific language structures and problems of translation. But it is precisely here that specific cultural and historical peculiarities are articulated. So Plotnikov, a Russian philosopher uh, living, living in Germany and teaching in Germany for decades, draws our attention to the importance of different concept histories and different language traditions. Besides fundamentally different grammatical structures by which we grasp reality, there may be conceptual categories that have developed differently and may, may bear different meanings. He exemplifies this with the notion of person in German and Russian traditions. The transfer of ideas does not allow for one, to one transmissions as the Russian notion of person has a different conceptual history and shows only one of three components that are connected with the Western notion of person in Western history of philosophy. Translators who have no idea of different world fields and conceptual traditions with different connotations and uses can cause misunderstandings and irritations, even beyond the translation of philosophical texts, which are best done by philosophers and that know about these distinctions. How can we understand not only statements or texts, but also other people from foreign cultures? Undoubtedly, knowledge of different worlds and their linguistic forms of life are important to understand the spoken word and various contexts. We should certainly use internal self descriptions and interpretations of those living in a culture as a base. Observations from the outside are not enough. From an external perspective, we can find other things to be relevant than those considered to be essential internally. Foreign interpretations might contain blind spots and miss the point, but you can also be blind for the specificity of the own. So in my view, both perspectives have to be combined. But beyond the field of rationality and necessary language research, untranslatables will remain. This is why some language philosophers propose empathy and sensitivity for other forms of life and language habits. For these untranslatables must be approximately, approximated as closely as possible. I refer here to Barbara Cassin's book, Les Intraduisibles, in English, Dictionary of uh, Untranslatables. It is not enough if we rely on translations, if we want to achieve a better understanding of foreign cultures because we do not experience other ways of thinking. And to come back to an African philosopher in the end, in a decolonized world, according to Diane, the formerly colonized must and may be able to break away from the mental patterns and normative thought regulations of the colonial languages in order to find their own idiom and express themselves. But Bashir Diani has yet another piece of advice. Let us then imagine a pedagogical utopia. We know that the pediment of Plato's Academy said, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here. 
the new academy of the 21st century global world may ask, let no one ignorant of a radically other tongue enter <clears throat> than her own enter here. Utopia, really? That is the situation of African philosophers, end of quote. It was already Amor who had to think his way into a different world of life and language in order to express himself and his thoughts in it. And this would also be a good practice for us today, centuries later, in times of globalization, to think beyond the previous constraints and limitations of our own language that we did not realize. Knowledge of a radically different language would indeed be a good prophylactic against ignorance with an educational value and can actually be passed on as an educational goal. We would know that the logic and structure of our own language is not universal and that we by no means may project our own self-evident facts into the foreign, where our own interpretation patterns cannot be taken for granted. And this would prevent any language imperialism and ensure more understanding between cultures in a hopefully more peaceful world. And this peace will not be assured if one dominating language and correlated worldviews do not realize and respect other ways of seeing the world. Thank you for your attention. And now I'm looking forward to your questions, but in the end, I might show you um, the book titles. First one is the book where the German ver version of my talk today has appeared, a book on Amo and subtitled Philosophy at the Call for Interculturality. And the second one is the already mentioned book by our president, Übersetzen, Sprachenvielfalt und Interkulturelle Hermeneutik with uh, English and German contributions. Um, following a conference that I, I have or, organized on this topic. Thank you so much. And now. All right. Um, to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this, um, uh, for this uh, most interesting presentation and, um, and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh,